Good, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Welcome to this session. It's a, it's a continuation of the nursing process, whereby in this case, we are going to be looking at the physical nursing techniques. Thank you so much for making time for this. Let's proceed. Now, so in physical assessment, we'll be looking at the four steps of physical assessment, starting with the inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. It's normally abbreviated as IPA, okay, in proper physical assessment. We begin by saying that physical assessment involves four basic techniques. That is inspection, palpation, percussion, auscultation, abbreviated as IPA. We say that Correct performance of these techniques helps elicit valuable information about patient condition and mostly relating to objective data. Inspection requires the use of the vision to observe details of a patient's behavior, appearance, and movement. We are saying that we use special lighting and various pieces of equipment such as an otoscope in case of an ear, a tongue blade in case of the flow of the mouth, and an ophthalmoscope in the case of the eye to help enhance vision and examine in otherwise hidden area. So how do you describe a patient's appearance? You look at the age, you ask yourself, does the patient appear to be the it to be his or her stated age? Does he look older or younger than it? We look at physical condition. Does he look healthy? Some people say sick looking, fair general condition, overweight, underweight. In terms of dressing, is the patient dressed appropriately for the season? In terms of personal hygiene, is he clean? Is he well groomed? Is he unkempt? Okay, what are the patient's uh, behavior categories? Patient behavior categories can either be assertive, activated, or submissive. Most of these peer, uh, patient appearance, patient behavior, and movement are very key when you're looking at the psychiatric, psychiatric assessment of a patient. Review of those techniques. We say that inspection begins the first time the patient uh, is in contact with the client or the, client, the healthcare provider is in contact with the patient and continues throughout the assessment. Palpation usually follows inspection, except when examining the abdomen or when assessing infants and children. Palpation involves touching the body to determine the size shape, position of structures. It also helps us to detect and evaluate temperature, pulsation, and other movement and elicit tenderness. So there's a question where I'm saying, which physical assessment technique does the healthcare provider use to assess temperature? Palpation. Which physical technique that the patient that the healthcare provider used to assess pulsations? Palpation, very good. So, guys, we can say that palpation. We have four palpation techniques. In fact, five. Let's let's have five. We have light palpation, deep palpation, light ballotment, deep ballotment, and lastly, by manual palpation. We're saying that ballotment evaluates a flowing or a movable structure. Performing ballotment involves applying pressure against the structure being assessed and then waiting to feel it rebound. For example, this technique is useful in checking the position of an organ. For example, which organ do you normally test for rebound tenderness? Appendix, very good. And lastly, the fetus, okay? Very good, guys. What about percussion? 
Percussion shows a quick, sharp tapping of the fingers or hands against a body surface to produce sounds, detect tenderness, or assess reflexes. Percussion for sounds helps locate organ borders, identify organ shape and position, and determine whether an organ is solid or filled with fluid or gas. So guys, which one of the following physical assessment techniques helps locate organ borders? Hello? Percussion, very good. Percussion helps us to determine organ borders. And this will be remembered when you're looking at the liver most of the time. So we continue by saying that organs and tissues produce sounds of varying loudness, pitch, and duration depending on their density. For example, we have air-filled cavities, which are these air-filled cavities like the lungs. They produce markedly different sounds from those produced by the liver and other dense organs and tissues. Percussion could be of three types. We have indirect percussion, percussion, okay, indirect percussion. We have direct percussion and bland percussion, okay? Great, guys. Let's look at auscultation. So auscultation involves the use of a stethoscope to listen to various sounds of the body and particularly those that are produced by the heart the lungs, the blood vessels, the stomach, and the intestines. So most auscultated sounds result from the movement of air or fluid through these structures. Auscultation usually is usually performed after the assessment techniques. However, when assessing the abdomen, auscultation comes after inspection but before percussion and palpation. Because if this happens before you do that, what happens? Yes, it will alter the bowel, the bowel sounds. The case is the same when assessing infants and young children. We are saying that auscultation should also occur before percussion and palpation because infants and young children may start to cry when palpated or Cast. Okay? Auscultation, you're saying, is the most successful when done in a quiet environment and with a properly fitted stethoscope. Guys, these are some of the equipments that will be very important when you are doing physical examination. You need a disinfectant pad. You need a flashlight. You need a patient drip, a stethoscope. Gloves, depending on how you're, it's going to be involving. Otoscopes, figmanometer, stethoscope, okay? Speculum, right? Very good. So we have this concept of the difference between antiseptics and disinfectants. And that's why I'm asking these questions. What is the relationship between disinfectant and antiseptics? indicate true or false or antiseptic or disinfectants are antiseptics and all antiseptics are disinfectants the correct the correct view guys is that all antiseptics are disinfectants but not all disinfectants are antiseptics okay so antiseptics can be used on living uh, living surfaces, okay? Skin, body, disinfectants are to be used on non-living, okay? On non-living things. Antiseptics will not harm the living tissues. Disinfectants can harm living tissue since they are more toxic and more corrosive than the antiseptics. Antiseptics are to be, can be used on cuts when a patient has wounds or infected tissues. Disinfectants 
are supposed to be used to be to, for cleaning surfaces such as uh, floor, floors, table tops, doorknobs, switches, handles, bathroom, etc. When you look at antiseptics, antiseptics they do kill microorganism or prevent their growth. In short, what do you say, guys? Antiseptics can either be bactericidal or bacterial static. When you compare to disinfectants, disinfectants are bacterial cidal. Very good, guys. Very good. So in preparation, we are saying you need to inspect all the equipment and supplies to ensure that they are in good shape. They are not expired. They are not defective. They are not having compromised integrity. Okay. If any has, then you need to remove them from the shelf and replace them based on the facility uh, procedures and policy. Okay. Great. On implementation, we are saying you need to gather and prepare the necessary equipment and supplies. You need to perform hand hygiene. Uh -oh. How long are you supposed to perform the hand hygiene, guys? Yes? We need to take at least 20 to 30 seconds. Okay? You start by applying a palm of uh, a, a palm of the product of a cup hand covering all the surfaces. You rub the hands palm to palm, right palm over the right the left dorsum with interlaced fingers and vice versa. Palm to palm with fingers interlaced, interlocked, back of the fingers. To the opposing palms with the fingers interlocked, rotational rubbing of the left thumb uh, clashed uh, in, in the right palm and vice versa, rotational rubbing backward and forward with clasped fingers of the right hand in the left palm and vice versa. Then you once dry your hands once they are safe. So guys, in implementation, you need to gather and prepare the necessary equipment. You need to perform hand hygiene. You need to confirm patient's identity using at least two patient identifiers. That's the name and the age. You provide privacy and you explain the procedure to the patient and family as appropriate. Remember to raise the bed, uh, the bed to the waist level. This is part of the ergonomics policies. You need to ask the patient to undress, then you drape patients appropriately. If you have any challenges, you need a chaperone to accompany you when you are assessing the patient. Okay? You need to make sure that the room is warm and adequately lit to make the patient comfortable and aid visual inspection. You need to wash your hands and the stethoscope guys okay and you put on gloves as required very good guys i have a small quiz here it says a public health nurse has been asked to teach the importance of hand washing to elderly clients which statement by a client indicates that the teaching has been effective the teaching has to be good Guys, we are looking for the best thing or the correct thing about hand washing. Okay? So this question, you look at either each statement. You look at if, if it is true or false. Okay? Option one, water, warm water is best for all infections. Guys, these all-inclusive answers are not correct. Warm water is the best. Okay? Bacteria have the very... Uh, in, in terms of the temperature, they vary differently. We have those ones that can be killed at high temperatures, low temperatures, and this thing of all infection does not serve as well. So this correct answer is, this, this answer is, is not correct. Okay? Soap is the only product that can be used to control of infection. Guys, what did I tell you about these all-inclusive answers? They are never correct, okay? Soap is just but one of the products. What about D? 
wash the hands for at least 15 seconds. Guys, we just looked at it and we said you need to wash the hands for at least 20 seconds. Guys, the correct answer is C. Friction while washing hands decreases transmission of bacteria. Okay? Great. What about this one? Following an educational session on proper hand hygiene, the nurse educator observes a nurse washing hands before entering a client's room. Which observation will alert the nurse educator to the need for further education? Guys, here we are looking for the wrong statement. We are wrong option, okay? So, so the first, the, okay, we can start the last one. The patient uses at least three to five meals of liquid soap. Guys, if you're using liquid soap, this is the correct volume of soap that you're supposed to use, okay? Great. The nurse keeps hands lower than the, lobe, uh, the elbows while washing. Okay, the hands should be lower than the elbows. Okay, this is correct information since you are not going to infect the other parts. Okay, great. Okay, so you're not going to spread the microbes to the other part, the unwashed part or the washed part. What about A, guys? The nurse dries, the, dries from fingertips down towards the elbows. Fingertips to the elbows. Guys, this is a correct... This is a correct teaching also. The wrong teaching, guys, is that the nurse dries from forearms up towards the, the fingers. This one is able to introduce microbes, yeah, to the other part, okay? So in inspection, we say, guys, we use our eyes to observe the patient and we are paying particular attention to patient's appearance, behavior, and movements. We are almost uh, interested with the facial expression, the mood, the body habits, and the condition. So focus on these areas related to the patient's reasoning for, for seeking care, okay? The, the reason for seeking care, that's where you need to concentrate as a healthcare provider. So for you to inspect a specific body area, you need to be sure to expose the area sufficiently you need to survey the entire area, noting the landmarks and checking the overall condition. You need to focus on the specifics, such as color, shape, okay, texture, size, and movement. You need to note unusual as well as the expected finding. The second technique, guys, is palpation. Palpation, palpet. Tell the patient what to expect, such as occasional discomfort as you apply the pressure, as this one will try and help to allay the anxiety and promote patient support or involvement in the procedure. Encourage the patient to relax because muscle tension and guarding can interfere with the performance and the results of the palpation, okay? Great. Provide just enough pressure to assess the tissue beneath one or both hands. Then assess the, the pressure and gently move to the next area, systematically covering the entire surface you are assessing. So to perform light palpation, we need to depress the skin, denting it around 1.3 centimeters. We say one to two centimeters, as other textbooks will put it. Remember to use this the lightest touch possible because excessive pressure blunts your sensitivity. Guys, you can look at our diagram. We have light palpation depressing the skin at 1.3 centimeters. If the patient is able to tolerate light palpation, then you need to assess for, you assess the deeper structures. And you palpate deeply by increasing your fingertip pressure to an indenting length 
or depth of about two to four yeah, centimeters. Okay? So place your, your other hand on top of the palpating hand to control and guide the and guide the movements. Okay? So hand on top of the palpating hand. Very good, guys. So after you've looked at the light palpation and deep palpation, we look at the second, the third and fourth type of palpation, and that is light ballotment and deep ballotment. So what happens in light um, ballotment? So to perform light ballotment, you need to apply light rapid pressure from quadrant to quadrant on the patient's abdomen, okay? You keep your hand, keep your hand on the skin to detect the tissue rebound. On the other hand, for deep ballotment, you need to perform deep ballotment. You apply abrupt deep pressure and then release it. You maintain the fingertip contact to detect tissue rebound. Remember, this one is performed after the patient has been able to tolerate the other one, okay? What about bimanual palpation? Here we are using both hands. That's why we call it bimanual. Bi means two. We are using the two hands to trap a deep underlying hard to palpate organ, such as the kidney in this case here, or the spleen in the other case, okay? Bimanual palpation is also used to fix or stabilize an organ, such as Uterus, in this case, okay, uterus palpation, you can see how you're supporting, okay, stabilizing while you palpate it. So those are the some of the instances where you're going to use by manual palpation. Ladies and gentlemen, we have other areas where we use by manual palpation, especially when you're assessing the flow of the mouth, okay. When you are assessing the uterus, we have already mentioned, and when mentioning these other uh, organs, like the spleen and the liver, we normally employ the scale of bimanual palpation. Percussion, guys. So at first, you decide which percussion technique best suits your assessment. Remember, we have three types of percussion. We could have indirect palpation, percussion, direct percussion, and bland percussion. So, indirect percussion, it reveals the size, the size and density of underlying thoracic and abdominal organs and tissues. Whereas direct percussion, this one helps uh, assess an adult sinuses, okay, for tenderness and elicit sounds in the child's thorax. Bland percussion, it aims to elicit tenderness over the organs such as kidneys, gallbladder, or liver. It's also good to note the characteristic sounds when percussing. All in all, guys, when you'll be percussing in human beings, you are likely to note uh, these sounds, dullness, flatness, Hyperresonance, resonance, and timpani. Okay, great. Comparing the sounds, looking at the intensity, pitch, duration, quality, and the source, you find that you find that dullness is associated with the liver, full bladder, and pregnant uterus. It's high in pitch. Flatness is soft in intensity, okay? It's generally associated with muscles, okay? What about hyper resonance? This one is very loud, hyper, very loud, okay? It is associated with hyper inflated lungs. An example in case, it will be the COPD emphysema type okay what about resonance we are saying that this one is a normal lung sound okay so which one is the normal percussion note 
In the lung tissue, guys, resonance, great. What about the abdomen? Tympony, okay? So you have tympony, you have resonance, hyperresonance, flatness, dullness, okay? Great. So what about direct percussion? So to perform direct percussion, you tap your hand or fingertip directly against the body surface, okay? What about blunt percussion? We're saying that you strike the ulnar surface of your fist against the body surface. Alternatively, you place the palm of one hand against the body, like here, okay? And then you make a fist with the other hand. You can see this one is a fist. And then you strike the back of the first hand. This is blunt palpation. Great. Let's look at auscultation, guys. In auscultation, we first determine whether to use the diaphragm or the bell of the stethoscope. So the diaphragm is used to detect high sounds, such as breath and bowel sounds. It should be kept in our mind that we do not need to describe bowel sounds are absent until you hear no sound for five minutes. We are saying that we need to use the bell to detect low-pitched sounds like the heart and the vascular sounds, while the diaphragm we are using for high-pitched like the breath and bowel. BB, HV, okay? So we place the diaphragm or the bell of the stethoscope over the appropriate area of the patient's body. You place the earpieces in place. Then you listen keenly to identify the sounds and try to identify their features. You determine the intensity, pitch, duration of each sound and check the frequency of the recurring sounds very good guys can you have the answer for this you're saying that the nurse the which finding will indicate bowel functioning is returning after anesthesia and surgery for a client with nasogastric tube very good guys auscultation indicates bowel sounds in all the Quadrants. Auscultation of bowel sounds indicates that the bowel is recuperating, recovering from the effects of surgery and anesthesia. Peristalsis is returning, and if it progresses, then passing of a gas becomes the next step. The results of palpation, percussion, inspection do not give definite information regarding peristalsis return. So, guys. When you're asking about a bowel sounds really absent, before concluding that bowel sounds are absent, ask yourself the following. Did I use the diaphragm of my stethoscope to auscultate for bowel sounds? You know, the diaphragm detects high-pitched frequency sounds, such as bowel sounds, whereas the bell detects low-pitched low pitch frequency sounds such as vascular breeds or venous hum. You also need to ask yourself, did I listen for at least five minutes in the, for the presence of bowel sounds? Normally, bowel sounds occur every five to 15 seconds, but the duration of a single sound may be less than one second, okay? Lastly, you need to ask yourself, did I listen for bowel sounds in all quadrants? We are saying that bowel sounds may be absent in one quadrant, but present in another quadrant. Great. So when you're completing the procedure, you need to return the bed to the lowest position to prevent falls and maintain patient safety. You need to remove and discard your gloves if you had one. You need to perform hand hygiene. You need to clean and disinfect your stethoscope with a disinfectant pad, performing 100, and you need to document your findings. 
we have special consideration when you are performing physical assessment. We're saying that avoid palpating or percussing an area of the body known to be tender at the start of your examination. Instead, what are you supposed to do? You need to work around the area and then gently palpate or percuss it at the end of the examination. So this progression minimizes the patient discomfort and the apprehension. You need to perform a variation on deep palpation to pinpoint an inflamed area deep within the patient's body. You press firmly with one hand over the area you suspect is involved. Then lift your hand away quickly. If the patient reports that the pain increases, when you release the pressure, then you have just elicited rebound tenderness. So our clinical alert is that you suspect peritonitis if you elicit rebound tenderness when examining the abdomen. You don't palpate uh, because of the patient's fear of... Uh, if, you, if you can't palpate because of the patient's fear of pain, then try distracting the the patients with a conversation, then perform auscultation and gently press your stethoscope into the affected area to try and elicit the tenderness, okay? Complication of this physical examination is that we have rupture of enlarged spleen or infected appendix during palpation. So on documentation, guys, you need to document the assessment findings you teach uh, the technique used to elicit each finding, okay? For abnormal findings, we will want to know the name of the practitioner identified after identifying those abnormal sounds, okay? Time of time when you notify the practitioner, the prescribed intervention, the patient respond to those uh, interventions, teaching provided to the patient and family where possible. That will be included in the records. Okay, guys, we have a quiz here. A healthy client presents to the clinic for a routine examination. When auscultating the client's lower lung lobes, the nurse should expect to hear which type of breathing sound. Can someone tell us? Great. So guys, we normally have three normal lung sounds. We have vesicular, bronchovesicular, bronchial, okay? So the vesicular, these are normally heard most of the normal lung. Bronchovesicular, these are normally heard over the mainstay bronchi. And bronchial, or that is the tracheal sounds, these are normally heard over the, the trachea. So guys, that makes the correct answer to be C. Very good. So guys, we have common abnormal breath sounds or the adventitious sounds. We have rails. These are small clicking, bubbling, or rattling sounds in the lungs. They are believed to occur when air opens closed air spaces. About ronkai. These are sounds that resemble snoring. They occur when air is blocked or airflow becomes rough through large airways. What about stridor? These are whiz like sounds heard when a person breathes, usually occur due to blockage of the airway in the trachea or in the back of the throat. Lastly, we have wheezing, and this one we have high-pitched sounds produced by narrowing airways. Okay, guys. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you for creating time for this video. Please remember to subscribe in order to support this channel. Thank you.